Hi everyone, thank you for tuning in to my talk. My name is Arnaud Tapstra. I'm an external PhD student at Tilburg University and I also work at SURF, the National Research and Education Network in the Netherlands. Today I will present our latest work, also on behalf of my co-authors, on privacy issues within the context of online proctoring. Because online proctoring, whose usage grew immensely during the COVID-19 pandemic, is quite controversial when it comes to privacy. In many worldwide cases, students have spoken out against the usage of online proctoring because they feel it's too privacy invasive. Also, it turns out that algorithms used by the software have difficulties recognizing people of color and with certain disabilities. All in all, for some students enough reasons to challenge their institutions in court with mixed success. In previous scientific studies, these general sentiments that students find online proctoring too privacy invasive are confirmed. However, it remains unclear which specific aspects of online proctoring are causing the most issues and which aspects may be acceptable after all. Online proctoring actually can be applied in different ways, so let's begin with a closer look at what online proctoring actually is. Through online proctoring, students are observed during an online exam, either while they are doing it, which would be live, or after they've completed the exam by re-watching previously recorded material. Some proctoring software products even allow recordings to be analyzed automatically by algorithms. The aim of online proctoring is to ensure that students will not and have not cheated during an online exam. You can imagine that taking an online exam from your own home on your own device without any physical supervision opens up a whole list of ways to cheat. To prevent that, students are monitored remotely, either using traditional video conferencing software or more common nowadays using specialized online proctoring software, which is able to gather additional data other than just audio and video. For the present study, we were interested in which specific aspects of online proctoring are seen as problematic. To do so, we used Helen Nissenbaum's Privacy as Contextual Integrity framework. A couple of basic assumptions and observations about humans and society form the basis for this theory. Human beings are social creatures and whether we like it or not, we constantly share personal information with each other about ourselves, even unconsciously, such as our appearance, our emotions and details about our private lives. This is actually necessary for us as a species to build a society in which we can interact with each other. Thus, society is built on what Nissenbaum calls appropriate information flows. What is considered appropriate depends on the context specific norms. Suppose you go to the doctor, you typically tell them intimate details about yourself because you want to get better and you know that the doctor adheres to professional secrecy. However, when you just met a random stranger at a, a birthday party, you will likely keep that information to yourself. When such a norm is breached, privacy is violated. But how do you know that? Well, each information flow consists of five separate parameters which taken together describe such an information flow. A sender who transmits the message, a recipient who receives the message, a subject whom the message is about, an information type, what kind of information is being transmitted, and a transmission principle, conditions under which the transmission took place. Contextual integrity therefore provides us with an excellent framework to make the specifics of online proctoring explicit, what data is being shared with whom and under which conditions. So the first step we took in this study was finding the relevant CI parameters for online proctoring. We used a mixed method approach to get the entire list you see here. We interviewed three online proctoring experts at three different institutions. We studied three privacy policies of popular online proctoring software tools, and we studied existing scientific literature. We concluded that two out of the five CI parameters remain the same for all information flows, sender, in this case, always the proctoring software itself, and subject, in this case, always the student taking the exam. For the other three parameters, we found all the items listed here. 14 information types, 7 recipients, and 14 transmission principles. The next step then was generating information flows using all of these parameters, in a certain format, such that participants in our study could easily rate the acceptability of the entire information flow. Combining all the, information, uh, all the parameters together yielded a total of 1,372 information flows. Some combinations did not make sense, so after excluding those, we still had 1,064 left. Of course, that's way too many flows for a single person to rate, so instead we created sets, one for each information type. On average, each set contains 76 flows, which is a fair amount for a single person to rate. 
Each participant was then randomly assigned to one of those sets, and since we had 456 participants, we had an average of 32 respondents per set. Per information flow, participants rated the acceptability of that flow using a 5-point Likert scale ranging from completely unacceptable to completely acceptable. All participants started with a baseline question, which contained no transmission principles and where the recipient defaulted to a proctor from your institution. The averages from this question can be seen in Table 1. We can already observe big differences in the acceptability of certain information types. In Table 2 and 3, we can observe the averages of, for the other parameters, recipients and transmission principles. We calculated these by computing the averages of all information flows containing that parameter across the entire data set. But in addition to those averages, we were much more interested in what the effect of each parameter was on the other. Would acceptability increase or decrease for certain combinations? To do this, we created pairs. In this table, we see the average acceptability scores of information flows containing a combination of recipients in each column and information type in each row. And the cell color then indicates the acceptability of that combination from green, completely acceptable, to red, completely unacceptable. Next, we compared each pairwise average with the averages from the baseline condition using a Wilcoxon signed rank test. This exposes which pairwise averages significantly differ from, baseline, from the baseline values. Those which significantly differ are highlighted in this table using bold and underlined values. As we can see, these results clearly indicate that in some cases acceptability significantly decreases for certain combinations of recipients and information types. But in some cases, acceptability significantly increases. These bottom two information types, which are in the baseline considered, uh, condition considered completely unacceptable, are considered much more acceptable when the recipient is someone from within the context of education. A similar table was created for the pair information type and transmission principle. Here we can again clearly observe which combinations are considered acceptable and which are not. Again, after performing the Wilcoxon signed rank test, we see that for some cases acceptability significantly decreases after including a transmission principle in that information flow. Furthermore, again we see that the bottom two information types acceptability significantly increased for certain transmission principles. It even lifts the acceptability to slightly above neutral for the transmission principle if you've given explicit permission or consent. This is an interesting finding, as one of these two types of data, the highly sensitive relig religious, political, medical data, should under no circumstances be exposed within the context of education, and at least in Europe, is not allowed by the GDPR. The other information type, a video recording of your entire room, previously deemed highly unacceptable, also becomes more acceptable under certain conditions. The final pair we created combines transmission principles and recipients. Since we only asked the baseline question about information types, we had to use a different baseline value for this pair. We chose if the data is viewed or analyzed by a real person for this, as this is the most basic way of observing students during an, during an exam, both offline and online, regardless of what kind of software is being used. Here we can again see many significant decreases of acceptability for certain transmission principles, as well as many increases. Due to the lack of time, I'll quickly continue to the final slide with some discussion points and recommendations. Our first clear observation is that context indeed really matters. When observing the heat map tables more closely, we can often find a cutoff point between contextual borders, such as when recipients or transmission principles included in the information flow clearly fall outside of the context of education. In addition to that, for online proctoring, the influence on the acceptability is strongest for information types and transmission principles, both positive and negative. We also identified obvious privacy violations, such as the room scan, a complete 360 degree scan of the student's room. Instead, institutions could consider whether a scan of the student's desk or table, considered much more accepted, could be sufficient. Possibly this would only be possible after changing the exam reg regulations. Alternatively, consider asking students for explicit permission. A room scan, for example, is considered somewhat acceptable only in this condition. This is tricky though, as this type of permission should not be confused with consent mentioned in the GDPR as one of the legal grounds for data processing. And last but not least, although we did not investigate this further, it seems like making contextual factors explicit triggers something within students which makes them consider privacy issues more closely. 
so perhaps increasing students' awareness of how online proctoring actually works, which data is shared with whom and under which conditions could already lead to reduced anxiety, anger and frustration, and of course even lawsuits. Thank you for listening to my presentation. Please reach out to me if you have any questions or comments.